Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about a new discovery coming out of Hubble of something that we've found right here in the middle of nothing in the so-called interstellar space. And technically I'm not there just yet, I have to first leave this star system, but right here in between the stars. For the most part most people think it's empty, it's called space for a reason, right? But that's of course not entirely true and we've known this for a very long time. So let's talk about what Hubble discovered and welcome to What The Math. Now the word space itself is actually kind of interesting because it's far from empty. It's not really space at all. There's a lot of activity here, there's a lot of matter being generated, and there's also a lot of energy. Space itself is full of activity and full of stuff. And specifically here, there is something called interstellar medium. ISM, as it's also known, is um, a very interesting topic and it's been studied quite actively in the last five years or so, but it's only recently that we started to discover what really hides in between the stars in this so-called interstellar medium. There's a lot of things here. There's a lot of dust, there's a lot of molecules, there's a lot of atoms, and there's also a lot of activity. Back in the 30s, um, even then, scientists already suspected that interstellar medium probably contains a lot of um, ions from stars and a lot of particles just being thrown off by the solar wind that most likely ends up interacting with, with each other. And that's just the beginning. Obviously, things like supernova produce even more stuff. Nebula, dust clouds, all of this together is something that we refer to as ISM and it's something that is a lot more mysterious and a lot more active than we originally thought. Now even back in 2012 NASA discovered a lot of complexity in this so-called interstellar medium. They discovered something called PH, also known as polycyclic aromatic um, hydrocarbon that is often associated with um, basically organic matter. It's a precursor to um, a lot of amino acids, it's a precursor to things like DNA and proteins, and it's these uh, really complex organic molecules that were discovered by NASA um, basically in the middle of nowhere in the middle of ISM in between stars. And it already kind of surprised scientists, but not to the extent where they were shocked by it. They always suspected organic molecules were um, everywhere in the universe, and this only proved their point. And today the presence of these pH molecules has also been connected to, uh, well, basically the creation of life on Earth. We believe that these molecules eventually made their way into dust grains that created asteroids and planetesimals, and then landed on planet Earth eventually creating you and me. So in some sense, this also suggests that these molecules could have done the same in other star systems and potentially create organic life there as well. So there's a lot of excitement about studying these molecules, especially because we believe that to approximately 20% of all of the carbon in the universe is actually in really complex molecules. It's not just simple carbon flying around. But there is another really interesting, really, really complex carbon molecule that has been studied in the last few years very actively that's been very recently, specifically only a few weeks ago, discovered by Hubble Telescope. It's this right here. And if you know what this is, awesome. If not, let me tell you about it. And so as Hubble was looking around space, it discovered Buckminster Fullerene. Buckminster Fullerene is one of the most well-known unusually shaped but also very stable carbon molecules that creates literally the biggest molecule we've discovered in space so far. So this right here is exactly 60 uh, atoms of carbon formed in a shape of, well you can technically call it a soccer ball because that's what soccer balls usually look like. It's a combination of pentagons and hexagons and the reason it's called Buckminster Fullerene is because it resembles so-called geodesic domes. This one is the probably most famous one. This is in my hometown of Montreal. And this architectural marvel was created by Buckminster Fuller, who um, was an American... Well, actually, he was a really cool person. And there's no word for it to describe him as a person because he did so many things. His whole goal in life was to literally inspire people and show people that um, a simple person can become a lot of things and can create a better world and this is kind of what he did uh, in a nutshell and this was one of his creations. But anyway, um, he deserves his own video, one day maybe we'll make one about him. But the cool thing is that um, eventually scientists decided to name this after him, mostly because of his contribution to science and just because he was a cool guy. 
So um, this is called Buckminster Fullerene and it's 60 um, atoms of carbon all together in a very, very stable formation that exists pretty much everywhere in nature. As a matter of fact, anywhere where you can find carbon and energy, such as of course space, you will find uh, Buckminster Fullerene. Now we've actually discovered these molecules a few years ago, but now we've also found the type of Buckminster fullerene that's um, ionized and is ready to combine with other molecules. So in other words, we've discovered the organic compounds that can create even more complex organic compounds. And this is kind of mind-blowing in a sense because it's the kind of stuff we expect to happen here on Earth, but not really in the middle of nowhere in between stars. Now here on Earth, usually you can easily find uh, Buckminster Fullerene in things like soot coming out of uh, a chimney or any kind of a source of um, carbon burning. And you'll normally discover Buckminster Fullerene in a lot of locations that involve um, organic molecules and their interaction with energy and the environment. So in other words, um, usually Buckminster Fullerene is also actively involved in some kind of organic activity. And we still don't really know much about this molecule itself, but we know that it's really important. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, we've already started looking at how it contributes to development of other molecules, how um, various types of Buckminster fullerenes combine with other organic stuff and create various shapes. But most importantly, we learned how to create so-called nanotubes because of this molecule. This here is a tiny tube that could be used for sending anything through it. And it's very stable. It's very, very hard to break. This right here is still not really widely produced, but it's already uh, well understood and we're able to make enough of it to manufacture all sorts of interesting compounds, including one of my favorite ones, the blackest thing we've ever made. The material that you see right here known as Vanta Black. Now, all of this is made using nanotubes and all of that came from the understanding of Buckminster Fullerene. And all of this, in a sense, relates to the wider picture here of how various carbon molecules and various compounds could be actually recycled across galaxies using the so-called interstellar media. So here, this is one of the models that suggests that the ISM, the interstellar medium, eventually turns into dense molecular clouds, which then turns into protoplanetary disk, uh, creates the star, creates the planets, then the star expires and releases all of this new material, including, of course, the uh, Buckminster Fullerene, including the PAH, that is then spread across the galaxy, across the universe, and eventually restarts the cycle again. So it's very likely that some of the compounds that we have, um, for example, in our bodies, may have been recycled for many generations before they finally made it into our bodies. This literally suggests that all of these molecules that we have in our bodies, all of these molecules that are important for life, are everywhere in the galaxy and most likely in the rest of the universe. So this really increases the chance for us to one day discover other organic life somewhere out there in the universe because if this is how life is formed in general, it definitely has to exist somewhere else. So this discovery of a very complex, very large molecule that's already ionized and that's ready to connect to other organic molecules is an indication for us that um, life as we know it on Earth can definitely exist in other locations. And so as I'm flying through interstellar space right here in Space Engine, it really makes me think about this differently. I'm not really flying through emptiness. I'm not flying through nothingness. I'm flying through a lot of different compounds, a lot of different things being literally recycled right now. And most importantly, I'm flying through compounds that could one day, maybe somewhere, create life very similar to what we have on Earth, but obviously very different in terms of the actual appearance. And although our understanding of interstellar medium is very, very limited right now, we're going to eventually learn and understand it better, especially because uh, both Voyager probes, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, have now officially entered the so-called interstellar medium and have been flying through the ISM for the past few years. And although they might not be able to help us identify the actual molecules that they discover in the ISM, both of the Voyagers still have their ion measurement device active. So they could potentially discover the same Buckminster Fullerene that we discovered using Hubble very close to our own solar system, which would of course indicate that all of this stuff is constantly falling into our solar system or maybe escaping our solar system, suggesting that all of this ISM activity is actually constantly active. In other words, various materials leave our solar system, while at the same time, various other materials probably enter it. So there's probably a lot of mixing going on in between various stars. 
And there's a lot of things happening here that do provide evidence to, well, extraterrestrial life. And one day we'll probably discover something out there, specifically a molecule somewhere in the ISM, that will provide enough evidence for us to know for a fact that organic life exists somewhere in the universe. But until then, that's all I wanted to mention in this video. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about space, universe, and of course, various scientific discoveries. And come back tomorrow to learn something else you may have not known before. On that note, subscribe if you still haven't, share this video with someone who loves learning about sciences, and maybe even support this channel on Patreon because it does help me quite a lot. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye-bye.